The theme for today is academic development and standards for technology enhanced learning. Um, resistance or assurance. We will start today's session with uh, Michael Sankey. Welcome, Michael. Thanks, Hank. Um, Michael is currently the Deputy Director of Learning Transformations at Griffith University, and he um, and he has started fairly recently at Griffith. Um, he's also the Director of ACODE Learning Technologies Leadership Institute, and so. He's been um, involved in the ACODE benchmarking process, and that's mostly what he will be talking about today. So I will, um, I will stop talking and hand over to Michael. Uh, thanks very much for joining us, Michael. It's a pleasure. Um, uh, Michael will be presenting for about 15, 20 minutes. If you have questions, you can use the chat room. Um, and then after that, hopefully, we'll have a little bit of a discussion about about this. So, Over to uh, you, Michael. Thanks, Hank. Um, it's not just about the benchmarks I'll be talking about, we're talking also about uh, where we're going in relation to standards in for uh, course environments as well. So uh, I noticed the slides of uh, the aspect of the slides has changed a bit, so it's thrown a bit of the text out. So hopefully, as we progress through, uh, that won't affect it too much, but uh, we'll see how we go. Okay. Uh, so we are talking about, uh, we know students are seeking some form of consistency within their courses and units, uh, especially in their online environment, but also in their face-to-face -face environment as well. We also know that Texa is very interested in this. Uh, with discussions we've had with Texa, they uh, started early in terms of, um, you know, with the, with the threshold standards and things like that, but now they've got them kind of under their belt. They're starting to look at other areas within the higher education uh, network and part of that is to look at the consistency uh, for learning outcomes between face-to-face -face and online courses. Now this means that institutions really have to have some quality processes in place to ensure quality of both, both the course level and the process level. So that is at the unit level or course unit level but also at university processes and things like that. Now they've had the process part going for a while uh, but now they're starting to think very seriously about uh, standards at the course unit level. And so <clears throat> I think it's on the 5th of May, uh, there's the, the first meeting of a, of a think tank uh, around that uh, in the online environment uh, where uh, uh, I think five or six of us are getting together to talk that through. So I'm representing ACODE at, at that, uh, in that meeting. Uh, and there'll be Belinda Tyne from RMIT, uh, Gregor Kennedy from uh, uh, from Melbourne, uh, Beverly Oliver from Deakin, and there's somebody else, and the name escapes me right in a second. But uh, we'll be getting together with Texa to talk about how, what that might look like as we move forward. Now, as we move forward, I think the role of the televisors is actually really important because uh, we aren't a, a village uh, by ourselves. Uh, we are all villages within our institutions, uh, but we're going to be raising up a new child. And, uh, and across the sector, we need to be a village. And so as this new child is born, we need to nurture that child into, into being and have some input into the way in which our institutions are feeding into this process. Each institution will get a chance to feed into this process. Uh, and we need to be on the front foot in relation to what that might look like. So at two levels, so the uh, at the unit course level, and also at the uh, at the process level, the institutional level processes that this might entail. And so just a, a wee bit of history about that first in terms of where we've come from from benchmarking. So now we see that the uh, yeah this this aspect ratio has caused a bit of problem here, but uh, for a number of years, so even going back to 2014. We know that uh, the higher education university sector has been looking at how to evaluate and benchmark certain elements of their practice. Now, in my case, it's and ACODE's case is to do with the the uh, institutional processes through the ACODE benchmarks, but it also happens, of course, at the discipline level um, and through things like the AACSB and all those kinds of things that allow us to map certain activities against what we do. Texa particularly is interested in, as you see, the, the 
circled part here, the purpose of benchmarking is not to standardise all courses uh, and all assessment outcomes, uh, but to reveal variations and establish whether those variations arise from individual nature of a course or the student cohort or from variations in quality of academic standards. And it's that's, that's getting down to the nub of where they're looking at. So yes, they acknowledge that there are variances and there'll be lots of variances, but that there is a standard that's being applied and being benchmarked across other institutions. So they go on to say through their guidance note around benchmarking, threshold standards do not prescribe any particular process, but here are some indicative elements that could contribute to meeting the expectations uh, for benchmarking in the threshold standards. So then they're going to talk about uh, evidence that could be in which uh, come through benchmarking reports and follow-up interviews and things like that. So uh, they are certainly looking towards institutions to have processes in place as they move through into this notion of uh, the quality assurance in the online space. So yes, we've had the ACODE uh, benchmarks with Technology Against Learning, and we have got a, a major activity happening in Brisbane in June this year, uh, which you may or may not heard about at this point. Uh, but if you haven't, uh, if your institution is involved, I would encourage uh, you to promote that thought with uh, with your the powers that be. Uh, in simple terms, and well, there's the formatting has really gone will be there. Uh, the, the benchmarks do look at institu institutional wide policy and governance, uh, planning for institutional wide quality improvement, um, information technology systems, service and support, the application of technology enhanced learning staff professional development, staff support, number seven, student training and student support. Now, I don't want to dwell too much on that except to give a couple of examples. So what we do in our benchmark activities that started, the regular journey around this started in 2014, uh, where uh, we got together in Canberra with 24 institutions. Uh, it continued on now every second year, ACODE are running a, a major benchmarking activity. Then with, uh, in two, Last uh, to the year before last, 27 institutions were involved. Uh, and really, it's about having the conversations, sharing the knowledges that we have and learning from each other. And in that process, we start to, and it gets some performance indicators, of course, we start to see uh, where each other stand and how others, it's a learning activity. So we actually under, start to understand how other people might be doing it a bit better than us in certain areas. Uh, we then extended that last year uh, to the UK, where we had uh, 17 uh, UK institutions involved using the ACAD benchmarks in a summit over there uh, at the Open University. Uh, fantastic event. Uh, this, this is the ad for this, this one though, so here in uh, Brisbane at Griffith, we will be hosting our benchmark activity on the 25th and 27th of June, where institutions who have, designated, who have uh, put their hand up to do this. Uh, coming together to do that sharing. What's happened over the last uh, couple, of, a couple of iterations, 2014, 2016, we see across the top here that there are eight benchmarks. Not all institutions have done all the benchmarks. Uh, we see that uh, the X's, the X's mean those institutions that did it in 2014. This other C uh, indicates that they did it in 2016. And so you see some of dipped in once, some have dipped in a couple of times. Uh, there's quite a few, particularly down the bottom here and up through here that have been pretty heavily involved uh, across this. To be involved, an institution does have to uh, do two benchmarks. Uh, they don't have to do all of them. And you'll see in that that the most popular benchmark is number five, where 31 institutions, uh, that has been done uh, 31 times. Uh, now, that is about sta um, staff uh, training, um, staff support, I should say, sorry. So it's, it's, that seems to be the hottest, hottest topic. The least popular is uh, number seven, benchmark seven. They've only had 11 instances of that, and that is student training. So are we training our students to use technology hands learning from some centralised perspective? And we tend to avoid that one a little bit, tend to put that one in the too hard basket. Uh, just taking a look at number, so benchmark number five was the most popular. Uh, so the first performance indicator in that uh, says that the a framework for staff development and te technology-hence learning is part of the institution's learning and teaching strategy. 
And there are five indicators that you could choose to, so is it no staff development? Some staff development, some staff development partly aligned, staff development mostly aligned with the strategy and, and uh, extensive student staff development fully aligned with strategy. And we see that over the last uh, couple of iterations, uh, we've got a bit of a cluster map there and percentage wise where institutions have placed themselves. So if we're looking at 5.1, the top one there, uh, we see that in percentage terms, it's probably what, about 3% uh, gave themselves a one, uh, what, 30 something percent gave themselves a two, the largest proportion gave themselves a three. So some staff development partly aligned with strategy, uh, four, and then one, a uh, couple of people, a couple of institutions have actually given themselves a five, but there's extensive staff development. Importantly though, institutions just can't say that. They need to provide some evidence and some rationale as to why that might be the case. How effective is it? Well, from an individual's perspective, those taking part in the institutions, they're saying it's pretty good. Um, we, we found that the activity personally very rewarding, so you know, only one person in this particular survey found that uh, it wasn't. Uh, I believe the outcomes of the summit uh, will actively provide an impetus for change within the institution. Well, you know, 88, 80 percent uh, reckon that, that is going to be the case. We do a follow-up survey with them. Uh, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, I found most of the information I needed to provide critical evidence, credible evidence to, uh, to address the performance indicators we undertook. So again, almost 90% um, said that they were able to do that within the context. Now it's just one, it's not one person doing this, it's actually multiple people within the institutions undertaking this. And there was sufficient scope within the current suite of performance indicators in the benchmarks to cover technology enhanced learning scenarios at my institution. So uh, a pretty strong endorsement um, that uh, for this particular activity. So um, Anthony McLaren, who's the head of TEXA, did come and uh, provide the opening address at our last event. We did see that um, over the, all the institutions are involved. This is where the, the animations are, because this has now gone over the top, I can animate that. But uh, we saw that in 2016, on an average, 15 people were involved across uh, each institution. Obviously, there's a, a big outlier there where that was the Open University in the UK, had 100 people involved in this activity. They were taking it pretty seriously, and that's why they ran their event in the UK last year. So 401 people, so taking the Open University out of there, 300 people were involved in Australia uh, in their learning and teaching centres uh, across across um, the 27 or 26 in that case institutions that were involved. And from a personal level, I personally, uh, I was personally able to make the right uh, kind of judgments in relation to performance indicators to accurately, accurately represent institutional capacity within TEL. So these are the people who were undertaking these activities uh, two years ago. Moving down to the course level. So the AK benchmarks assume that we have some kind of tool at our institutions that will mediate a level of course quality. And that's why people don't necessarily score that well on that particular indicator. So we have the OLC, the Online Learning Consortium Quality Scorecard or Toolkit that they offer. Of course, we have Quality Matters. Uh, New Zealand, uh, colleagues in New Zealand have the e-learning guidelines. JISC run the e-learning quality standards. There's a European set associated with the e-excellence tool, the e-learning quality model. Is, uh, comes out of Sweden, we've got the ICDE, uh, the International Council of Distance Education have a quality standard. Ascolite uh, through DOM uh, are very heavily involved in trying to create some standards as well. And we have the Commonwealth of Learning that have standards. And of course, uh, not of course, but uh, ACAPE has some threshold standards for online learning environments as well, which are in the draft form, which we've been trialling for the last year across uh, three or four institutions to get feedback from them on these standards as we move forward. These, in an Australian context, may be subsumed by what uh, TEXA are about to launch into. And they'll be taking into consideration a number of the tools. They may well come back and say, well, we're ambivalent to which tool uh, an institution might use. So you could use Quality Matters, you could you could use something else, could be the AOK ones, could use the Ascolite ones. But uh, ultimately, there will be the need 
for institutions to apply some kind of tool to their online learning environments or standards across their online learning environments, particularly in relation to ensuring uh, the consistency of those environments and the way in which uh, there is they can uh, look to some equivalency across uh, the standards of the online learning. Uh, in the ACODE case, uh, the course design and course shells, are, so there's, there's 10 areas within the standards. We look at course design and course shells, welcome and course information, uh, orientation and getting started information, learning outcomes and course objectives, the alignment within those, uh, technology and online tools, learning activities, engagement and alignment, uh, learning resources, assessment feedback, support for learning, and uh, usability uh, and uh, WC3 compliance. So they're the, uh, the things that the uh, ACODE ones look at, uh, as do the comparative tools as well. Uh, we do think that the ACODE ones have a bit more of an Australian flavour uh, than, say, the Quality Matters do and they're built in a little bit of a different way, uh, but uh, let's let's see how they go and let's see where Texa comes down with this. I suppose uh, from the Teleadvisor's perspective, uh, what we're looking for is for as many people to be involved, as many of you guys to be involved in this as possible. And I'm happy to mediate some kind of activity around that, uh, as ACODE will be, because um, you're in the best place to actually uh, you know, make this alignment back to the particular tool. So if you haven't, uh, if you don't know who your A code rep is, um, please uh, go to that URL. You can just go to the A code site and the hot link on the right hand side of the of the A code site does provide you uh, with a link to the institutional members. So if you don't know who your member is, uh, A code, I should point out, is an institutional body. So uh, institutional representation. So each institution has a primary rep and a secondary rep, an alternate rep. Uh, and you can see the names of those reps on the, on the ACODE site. Uh, the reps uh, usually attend, uh, uh, there's three meetings a year that are run where the rep all the representatives come together. It is a council, it's not a, um, an association. So it's a council, this Australasian Council of Open Distance and E-Learning. <coughs> and so um, uh, the represent, you need to liaise with your representative to, if you want to have input into this process. Having said that, I'm happy to mediate a level of integration with that as well. So it's not just about the ACAD rep, though that's important. Some ACAD reps are not as active as others. And so uh, if your rep isn't terribly active, uh, we're happy uh, as an organisation, as ACO, to uh, have input from a range of different uh, people. And of course, um, the first opportunity for that is through the ACO benchmarking activity. So if your institution isn't involved at this point, it's not too late uh, to be involved. Uh, in fact, I'm running the activity here at Griffith and we don't start our activity till the 1st of May. And so uh, we haven't, Griffith have never benchmarked before. I've done it before with both RMIT and with USQ, uh, but I haven't uh, done it with Griffith yet. So we're just dipping our toes in for the first time with two of the benchmarks, um, staff development, staff support, those, those two quite popular ones. And uh, we'll, we'll head into those benchmarks and just try the journey for this place. Um, it'll be a new adventure for them. Others uh, are more experienced at that. Uh, if and. We do find, though, with the, the turnover of staff in, in uh, institutions, that sometimes institutional knowledge gets a little bit lost. If your institution did take part in the past and hasn't, uh, that rep is no longer there, we do still have records of what your institution might have done in the past in terms of the benchmark. So if that information is lost, uh, we can retrieve it for you. Um, I think I'd like to now throw it open to some discussion and uh, get some input in terms of how you think you might be able to contribute to this process. And uh, I'll look forward to uh, having some discussion right now. Thanks, Michael. Uh, first of all, that, that was um, that was really uh, useful and informative. Um, and hopefully we will get some uh, engagement with this process from everyone here. Um, just. Um, just to start off a couple of questions, there, there, there's a question um, 
There was an initial question posed that, that said what issues arise due to the pace of change in technology. Um, and Francis um, put a question in the, um, in the chat that says, are we including in benchmarking measures of adaptability and sustainability? Um, yeah, so the benchmarks do cover sustainability. Right. Uh, there, are, uh, there are process, there are performance indicators within the benchmarks that look at sustainability within some of those key indicators. So uh, in terms of uh, the sustainability of what we're producing as artifacts and also uh, the, the closing of the loop scenarios. So the, close, we're, the benchmarks are quite strong on the closing of the loop scenarios, particularly around technology hence learning. Uh, what was that first question? No, I just forgot what you said was the first question. Uh, now the first question was was around this, uh, around the pace of um, change. Oh yeah, okay. yeah. yeah. There's uh, Tom. Uh, Tom. Well, the pace of change actually is all the reason for this. I mean, the, we run this activity every second year because everything is changing so quickly, and so if we just did it once, uh, you know, we would uh, we'd be stuck in that in that particular spot. But uh, we do recognise that the pace of change is really quick. Um, I was just I was just in a, a meeting just before with a person from Microsoft because uh, we're we're moving pretty heavily into Office 365 over the next little while, and he was saying that um, they have now built a system, uh, an LMS kind of system that uh, puts uh, is based on artificial intelligence, and so and it's based on their analytics engine underneath there. So the, the, the amount of information that a person provides to the system can actually start to guide a, a, the, the students through their particular uh, learning journey uh, based on how much information you want the university or yourself as an individual wants to put in that system. So they're starting to see, they clearly see the, the LMS as being um, a smaller part of the whole ecosystem. That's interesting. Hey, I've got a I've got a hand up um, by Tom. Yeah. Hi, Tom. Hi, Hello. Tom. Hello. Uh, is the audio working? Yep. Yes, it is. Uh, it's Tom Worthington at the ANU in Canberra. Um, I was just asking um, whether formal education qualifications for teaching and design staff are included yeah. in this process. I've I just find it a little curious that to teach at a TAFE, I had to go and get a, a <laughs> yeah, so to yeah. teach at a university while it's encouraged to have something. Um, and I went out and got a grad, a graduate yeah. certificate and a master's. Yeah. In practice, these things don't seem to be worried too much about in universities. Well, it's fair to say that techs had tried to do that. Uh, Universities Australia at the time uh, didn't support the move to be that quick. They will return to this uh, without a doubt. Uh, part of the standards around teaching will involve some kind of formal qualification around teaching. They're kind of going a bit softly, softly and working with Universities Australia to see that come. Uh, it's, it's not as cut and dried as, as TAFE. Uh, because it's not just competency-based education. Uh, so there is, uh, you know, the whole notion of research comes into that where research uh, interfaces with, with uh, teaching. So um, to make that, to, for them at the time, which I think was probably about three or four years back, for them to just say, oh, everybody has to have a, a grad cert, uh, that made it uh, problematic for universities to turn around that so quickly. So I think you'll find most universities have been pushing the grad cert knowing uh, that coming down the track, there will be a point at which um, that will happen. You already start to see in some of the position descriptions for lecturers, and we've seen it here at Griffith, where there is a requirement for a grad cert or some other kind of teaching qualification before you can even get to be a level A academic. So it's even appearing in level A academic position descriptions. So I didn't waste that $20,000 getting the master. No, no, but I think you passed the level A, but that's all right. Okay. <laughs> the grad cert only cost about three thousand, I think. Yeah, Thank right. you. Okay. Tax deductible, mate. Tax deductible. 
<laughs> um, are, are there any other uh, questions at this point? Um, if you have a question, just raise your hand and we'll um, hand it over. Um, well, um, Rodney, by the way, in the in the chat, Michael asks uh, for the name of the three six five LMS artificial intelligent intelligence product. Uh, based, uh, I can get that. I didn't. I haven't got that paperwork right in front of me right the second, but I can. Um, if I post it back through to you, Hank. Um, um, yeah, that that would be good. I need know Rodney's first name on here. I don't know who Rodney is. So. Uh, Tamblin. Sorry. Rodney Tamblin. Tamblin. Yeah. Okay. All right. I'll find that. I'll get that information out. Yeah. That's okay. Right. Uh, Chia's got her hand up. Yeah. Hi, Chia. Might need to unmute. Can't hear you, Chia. Uh. All right. Rodney's just said that he will. Uh, oh, Can gee, you hear me now? Yes. Oh, great. Okay, gotcha. Um, thanks, Michael. That was really informative. I got a quick question around the institutional um, standards that some universities may have, and I'm yeah. just wondering how you might you might um, make sense of it. So, how does this benchmarking standard from A Code would help? and in line or complements the institutional benchmarks or standards that some universities may have? Yeah, so the most, you know, well, there are there are a couple of tools that are used in, in benchmarking. So I'm talking about benchmarking technology, hence learning. There are a whole range of different benchmarking activities that happen. Some around uh, programs like, you know, accounting or business or something like that. There are other, pro, there are other benchmarks that they, that our IT, ICT people do. They, they have their corporate benchmarks. The, um, the libraries have their, their call benchmarks. So all the different groups have uh, different tools to be uh, benchmarking their own practices. Technology Hands Learning, of course, uh, spans across a lot of that. And so when we do benchmark at an institutional level, we're, we're, incorporate, we're including people from the IT groups, the library, uh, the academic developers, things like that, and from a, and more and most importantly from the, the schools and faculties themselves. Uh, so it is a tool of many tools that an institution will use uh, to benchmark. The important thing is, from Texas' perspective, is that there are benchmarking now uh, and in a, in a range of areas. So not just around tell, but you know, in terms of the spend we use on ICT, in terms of uh, uh, the the the, the amount of uh, money we're spending on library resources and things like that. So the difference, I suppose, in the in the tell benchmarks is it's based around a self-assessment followed by an institutional sharing, followed by uh, then closing the loop on that back at the institution. Now, not all the benchmarks work that way. So the, the ICT benchmarks, the quarter benchmarks, are simply a reporting of figures and things like that, and people can compare those figures. Which is valid for that that perspective. Uh, in this perspective, it is more around, uh, and, and I should say, the ACO benchmarks could be used at that simple level. They could be used by an individual institution as a standard, and uh, align themselves with that standard. Uh, that's not the way the tool was initially designed, or was, that's not the ideal intent for the tool. The ideal intent is that we we do that and then share the information with others around that conversation, so we can learn from each other. Yeah, uh, right. Figures are one thing. Uh, it's more around having those conversations. So it is a tool that, uh, as we know, many institutions are employing to help create that conversation. Yeah, great. Thanks, Michael. Some All right. might help as well here. Thanks. Yeah. So, thanks, Michael. Um, I'm just um, I'm just looking at the clock, and we've just gone past the halfway mark. So um, I would hereby like to uh, thank you, Michael, very much. Um, that was a great presentation, very interesting. Um, it will be, it is being recorded as well, so everyone um, who's missed bits, um, you can access this later and we will send the link. Um, the other uh, part to this is that um, for those of you who were a bit late, um, we started with Michael because there was a few issues um, with the sound for Sarah. 
those have now been resolved. So we will uh, we will change over to Sarah Stein in a minute. Um, and thanks again, Michael. Thanks for the opportunity, Hank.